Leading Burning Field Trips, Building Burning Skills. This is Joel Weintraub speaking, and the photo uh, is courtesy of Dr. Ernesty. I appreciate that. Let me start with a disclaimer that I accept no responsibility or liability for the accuracy or the completeness of the information contained in this video. That also covers how you use this information. So, introduction. Field trips can be important tools for nature interpretation and conservation. Who popularized this approach? Well, I can go back to, to Carl Linnaeus, 1707 to 1778. A botanist who invented field biology and naming species, a uh, modern way of doing it, Linnaeus named thousands of species himself and trained a generation of biologists who journeyed to the four corners of the world in search of the rest, and half of them died in the process. Linnaeus was especially famous for his field trips, which were basically botanical excursions during which he took students out into the countryside to collect plants, and there must have been something to see. Taking students on the field trips to the Uppsala Forest, Linnaeus hired trumpeters to lead the procession and provided elegant picnics for the occasion. That doesn't sound like my field trips. His students also took part in his regular field trips, which were typically attended by more than a hundred people of various nationalities. These were festive occasions with banners waving, a bugle sounding when a rare plant was found, students decorating their caps with plants, and kettle drums accompanying them on their march back to town. He and his students would spend the day collecting plants and animals, and then parade back into town singings, they could hear the students, you know, miles away, I guess, and playing horns and drums. I don't think my field trips are that rowdy, actually. And certainly for birding field trips, it would probably drive away birds with all the noise they were generating. Birding field trips provide a way of learning about birds, identifying species and their field walks in real time, seeing bird behavior and ecology not from books, but from nature, hearing about and practicing <coughs> the ethics of bird observation providing opportunities to discuss conservation concerns and a situation where birding skills can be taught and enhanced. A good field trip can accomplish most, if not all, of these goals. Now, the rules for field trips today with the ongoing COVID pandemic and concerns about liability by field trip providers read like legal documents rather than educational goals of field biologists. So I'm showing you, and I'm going to put this in the show notes, a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, addresses. Uh, here are three that discuss uh, protocols for field trips, recommendations for field trips. Very interesting to take a look at them. And we find that given the health concerns, liability concerns, and logistical concerns of group field trips in 2022, and I'm doing this in June of 2022, a less desirable but still useful approach for teaching about nature to students and naturalists in general could be a virtual field trip. And I'll show you a few citations for such field trips and then some that I have put online. So you can do a, uh, a Google search or, or an, uh, an online search for virtual field trips and find out that there's certainly a lot of uh, possibilities there. And here are three of them, for instance. What I've done is I have some online virtual field trips for birds. One of them on the headlands of Dana Point, California, where it's not just identification, but it's also talking about uh, the aspects of observation and some uh, natural history of each species. Also one I did on the common coastal birds of Dana Point. The uh, Upper Newport Bay uh, has a program for naturalist trainees, and because of the pandemic, I gave uh, the lecture part 
uh, by Zoom. And then I went out into the field and generated a, uh, a set of uh, films on virtual training field trips for those students. It's a three-parter. So not only emphasizes identification skills, but also trip leading skills and natural history. So you can do quite a bit with virtual training, but it certainly does not substitute for the real thing. Here's one I put out for moon watching for birders, uh, looking at birds crossing the uh, orb of the moon during migration. And if you look closely, you'll see a bunch of birds uh, that are in the upper left. A, uh, it's really a, an, an interesting way of, of uh, emphasizing migration. Now, <clears throat> what you're going to hear and see is actually uh, from a 1996 essay that in, ri in revising a handbook in 1996 for training docent naturalists, I decided to add tips for leading birding field trips. That year, Bird Chat, an internet birding lister board, which had hundreds of, of people participating, had a discussion on trip leading skills. A number of people contributed to that thread. I participated in those discussions, and I took a file of responses on the subject from Lisa Bryan and my own experiences and viewpoints to write an essay on the subject and put it in my handbook. The basis for what you're going to see here is that 1996 essay revised and updated to 2022. And in fact, uh, Birding Magazine in, I think it was June of 2002, actually published that essay. You can see it here, um, and we're going to go through the, uh, most of it updated. The August 2002 issue of Birding Magazine, at my request, listed the names of the chatters that contributed to the essay, including, and you can see a whole list of people here, and it's alphabetical, is it? I'm not quite sure how I arranged this, by the way. Uh, but here, I think, are about 26 people. The most deep disagreement among ourselves in 1996 was over how to handle a self-anointed anointed group leader that shows up, tries to take over the field trip, and whether and how one should try to identify all birds seen. My own biases are shown on, these, on those points in this essay and on this video. You may disagree with my views. That's fine. So before the trip, what do you need to know? Let the participants know in advance uh, what are the expected field conditions. Are they going to need special uh, shoes? Is hiking needed? Uh, whether water and bathrooms are available? Meal logistics, if you're out uh, for the whole day or even the weekend. Carpool availability. Are you going to provide a meeting area map online or sent to participants? Is there going to be a deadline time for waiting for latecomers? Comers? And they should know that, that you're serious about that. Uh, do you have a phone number or a website for bad weather trip cancellation? Or have you established an online mailing list of participants to send them updates? Are there arrangements to leave cars overnight uh, if you're going away from the area? Uh, optical equipment to bring and sharing rules and then COVID protocols. Do you need insurance needed to cover the group? Is there a trip release form for participants to sign? They should see that uh, in advance. And are there going to be fees that participants are going to have to pay uh, to enter park entrances? although some may have yearly permits uh, for their vehicle. Um, as a leader, uh, I would suggest you collect reference books on the biota of the area for the unexpected question. Collect visuals of key birds, maybe an owl pellet, demonstrations to show on the trip, especially if you're close to your car, and if things are kind of slow, you'll have uh, additional material to show the group. Depends on your goals. Have up-to-date local information on what has been seen, where you're going. eBird hotspots are a very useful uh, resource for that. And then you should know when high and low tides are, especially if you're going, obviously, to the ocean, sunrise and sunset times, and weather forecasts. 
do you need to contact in advance parks or preserves to let them know you're bringing a group and also to find out if there's an event that day that will interfere with your access to the site and burning opportunities. There might be a frisbee contest going on uh, where there be people all over the park or some historical reenactment, and you certainly don't want to go burning in the park at that same time. You should put together a first aid kit, at least a, a basic one, maybe ace bandages, safety pins, big bandages, um, chapsticks, extra shoelaces, etc. It's always a good idea to have that. And of course, there are COVID concerns. Now, I have a, uh, uh, a YouTube video from July of 2020, and I'm going to show you that on uh, spotting scope alternatives. And this is one of the slides from there that then nature centers were closed, organized field trips were canceled, loaner binoculars and scopes are no longer available to the public. But people can still go in the field and observe nature, but be aware of social distancing and wearing masks. That was in July of 2020. Also, I advise stay away from areas with large numbers of people and do not share your binoculars or field guides with others. And actually, we, you know, uh, we've come a long way from there, but not back to normal. We're going to talk about sharing equipment later. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to rely on CSA Audubon Society. It's an Orange County, California Audubon Society with lots of members and have thought through some of these COVID um, protocols. So I'm changing the background here to blue when I present something from CSA Audubon and I'm going to give you uh, the addresses for all of this. And <clears throat> all trips, all trips now on CNSage require advanced reservations due to the COVID pandemic. You just can't show up. Everyone signing up for a trip must provide information on their vaccination, type and dates, or photo of the vaccine card when making reservations. The field trip chair keeps a record of the vaccinations so that you only have to provide that information once if you're signing up for multiple trips that they have and you sign up online. People who have not received their vaccinations will not be allowed on any trip this year. Everyone must wear a mask on the trips. Each trip will have a participant limit to allow for social distancing. So it's a lot of regulations here. We need to make sure that our trips are safe for everyone. Otherwise, we will have to cancel them. And so here's their fifth, their field trip release form. This is online, can be filled out. There's a waiver. Uh, there's a section on understanding of risks. And here is a special form for their Christmas bird count. Uh, I found that interesting as well. And I think we might talk a little bit more about that. Now, if you're going uh, for maybe a weekend somewhere, uh, away from uh, your home base, then you're probably going to be traveling by automobile. And so I have a section on the essay on car caravans. You should get CB radios for at least the first and last car of the caravan. Also plastic st uh, streamers for each car's antenna, although you don't see antennas very much that stick out uh, from cars, so the group will know who is in the caravan. Each car is responsible for the one behind it. Makes sense. That means signaling and keeping cars in sight. It wouldn't be a bad idea to have a gas siphon, flat tire fixing devices, hose tape, extra fuses, etc. on hand in the lead vehicle, as well as maybe a tow cable on a cell phone, because everyone has cell phones today. Optional, tongue-in-cheek, it might help if you can pick locks of cars or have a lock bar device to get into cars with the keys still in the ignition. Although now one can call maybe AAA since we have so many cell phones uh, uh, that are on field trips. Drivers or owners of the cars should have, shouldn't, should not have to pay for the gas, especially with prices today. The passengers should divvy up that expense. Cars should arrive at the meeting site with a full tank of fuel. Let me repeat that. Cars should arrive at the meeting site with a full tank of fuel. And here is the CNSA Audubon Society. 
um, about uh, carpooling. For some outings, it's customary that participants make carpooling arrangements. Seeing Sage Audubon does not, does not have insurance for carpooling arrangements and assumes no liability for them. Carpooling, ride sharing, or anything similar is strictly a private arrangement among the participants. Participants assume the risk associated with this travel. And then they go into these two-way radios or these kind of walkie-talkies that involve car caravanning. They also help to keep the group together on the road and also allow the leader to notify the group of points of interest along the way. In fact, I even played uh, music for when I, uh, uh, biology songs uh, 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 along uh, the route for my students using walkie-talkies. Many people also use the radios to keep in touch with their friends or family members, which uh, are shopping in, or should be actually while shopping in large stores. So there may be other reasons to buy these. They can be very handy. Depending upon the kind you buy, some of the newer models have a range of 5 to 15 miles if there are no obstacles in between. Some of the newer models have rechargeable batteries, which are helpful. And CN Sage's field trip program will provide a loaner radio for each car on such a trip if no one in the car already has one. Now, I'll also mention here that in some of CN Sage's field trips, uh, there's a fee. For instance, there may be a marine uh, day trip out or, uh, you know, a very long distance trip that may have fees. And so the cancellation policy is shown up front on the website. Cancellations made within 30 days of the trip date will not receive any refund unless someone is found to take that person's place on the trip. For most of the trips which require reservations, there's often a waiting list of people who have notified the field trip chair that they are interested in the trip. The chair needs to make the decision on who is next in line, not the person who cancels, to take the vacancy. If you are canceling, and have found someone else to take your place, please notify the field trip chair first. They may, not be, uh, uh, they may not be able to go because of people who are on the list. Okay, so now we switch to meeting the group for uh, leading this birding field trip. So we, we, and this is collective, remember this is from the essay, introduce, introduce yourself to the group. Uh, what's your background? Get the group to introduce themselves to each other, if not too large. Name tags are another way of doing this. It might be a, a good way of doing it. It might be a little awkward, but that's fine. Discuss the goals of the trip. Discuss the rules. Don't trample vegetation. Stay with the group. The American Burning Association Codes of Ethics, etc. Explain where you're going, how long you will be out, where and when the bathroom breaks will be, Tell the group that more birds will be seen if they are quiet. You might want to talk about binoculars and spotting scopes, how to use them, how to tell a misaligned pair of binoculars, and why not to use them because of eye strain and headaches. And I have uh, two uh, YouTube videos on teaching a beginning birding group how to use a spotting scope. Uh, Though, you know, uh, well, we'll talk about spotting scopes. And then teaching a beginning birding group how to adjust binoculars. And I suggest that you refer these two videos to field trip participants in advance so they can watch them. Uh, You won't have to go through these adjustments. These videos, the videos show how to use, adjust, and maintain optical devices. The spotting scope video has sections on scope etiquette, like don't kick the tripod. It also discusses digiscoping, taking pictures through the scope, and possible damage to the scope by allowing the public to take such pictures and how to reduce risk. But later, we're going to talk about sharing optics and optical views during the pandemic, and the present consensus is that it's not recommended. It's really too bad. We have... uh, uh, you know, put in a large amount of money for loaner material. I have loaner binoculars and loaner scopes, and uh, on uh, field trips, I may not be able to do that and loan them out. Now, just to give you an idea about the digiscoping, this is in the um, the spotting scope YouTube video. 
Uh, and one way of protecting the lens, if you're going to allow this, is to put a lens cap with a hole in the center over the lens. Uh, the, the real image is actually ab above this, and then people are not going to scratch uh, the, the scope of the, uh, of this, uh, the spotting scope, of the lens of the spotting scope. Okay, so ask if anyone, uh, this is at the meeting, the beginning meeting, ask if anyone has any target species that she or he really wants to see. Indicate that if someone misses a special bird to tell you so that you can be on the lookout for another of that species. Otherwise, you won't know. And once you see a bird and identify it, if you see another one, you're not necessarily going to re-identify it. Find out the level of birding experience of the group and be sensitive to their individual level of birding experience. Um, uh, beginners uh, tend to be uh, feel that they're overmatched. So you want to try and maybe match up a beginner with a nice birder who can help them along the way. But then there's the question about social distance uh, during the pandemic. Keep your expectations for the trip reasonable. Discuss any safety issues at the start and warn the group about poison oak or ivy and other possible problems. Now, Sea and Sage has uh, at the meeting time that trip participants will be asked to sign a trip liability waiver on the morning of the trip. So this is a, a double um, uh, protection for them that each individual in advance has done uh, the, um, the trip uh, liability release form. And then the day of the trip, uh, this is passed around so people, again, can understand the risks, uh, the uh, liability of Sea and Sage, and uh, a waiver. So let's talk about sharing equipment. I mean, equipment is not only binoculars and spotting scopes, it's also potentially field, field guides. And this is a real, a real problem. Before the pandemic, my advice was to always have a spotting scope handy and encourage those who do bring scopes to share the optical views. But with the pandemic, the consensus is not to share equipment, as I'll show you uh, in more detail. So I went online just, just this last week or two uh, and found all these websites about uh, sharing. And so this one says, don't share binoculars, field guides, or spotting scopes, except with members of your immediate household unit. Or don't share optics or other equipment. There will be no shared views through spotting scopes and no loner binoculars. This is a Baltimore birding group. Or at Hawk Ridge. We will not be able to loan binoculars or share optics with visitors this fall. Or another one, bring your own binoculars and telescope. Sharing of equipment not recommended. Do so at your own risk. And now this is an interesting one that I found. They say this program um, offers binoculars for participants to use. These items are sanitized before and after use. If borrowing binoculars, you are asked to sanitize your hands and use the provided wipes to sanitize the binoculars at the end of the program. So, uh, I'm, they, you know, I would think they would also have a release of liability form. How do you sanitize an optical piece of equipment? So I looked at that. I looked at that. In fact, this person... Uh, ask the question, does anyone have any tips on how to safely share binoculars with people from other households? Is that even possible? And one response, uh, I don't agree with everything they say, is they see, the person says, I'd speculate, speculate that 70% isopropyl alcohol, and they use it all through ethanol, I wouldn't use that, uh, that's rubbing alcohol on the oculus eye cups, not the lens, I would think, would work. In fact, I would remove the eye cups to sterilize them. Alcohol is probably safe for the plastics in the eye cups because lens cleaning pads are usually alcohol-based. Well, yeah, but well, that's possible. So binocular designers would anticipate contact with alcohols. Do not use hand sanitizer. Interesting, which contains moisturizers to improve comfort. Com uh, comfort, it would gump up the optics. Now he's switching here. Um, 
the optics, I don't think he's, he really intends you to be wiping the optics with, uh, uh, you know, these pads, these cleaning pads. Also, you'd have to wear latex and nitrile exam gloves to avoid skin contact with the body of the bin, the binoculars. So there's some ambiguity here. He continues, Chances are no one has investigated the subject and uh, beyond the standard COVID survival on surfaces research. So please treat the suggestion as pure speculation, as it is, that might or might not work. Well, if it doesn't work, you know, you're going to get the disease. If your friends are birders, they likely own binoculars and probably extras to share with those who don't. But that creates its own problem, right? Uh, even when they get it back. So why not have everyone bring their own and remove all doubt? So um, I also looked at the camera people. And this person says from Olympus, who no longer make cameras, by the way, they want you to wipe down the exterior of your camera with alcohol-based sanitizing wipes. We recommend choosing products that are labeled as effective for killing 99.9% .9 of bacteria and viruses and are also bleach-free. And they talk about Lysol and Clorox wipes are examples. I don't know if they have hand moisturizers. Although any product meeting the above requirements may be used. We recommend cleaning the outside of your camera equipment regularly, not the lenses. Especially if it's been loaned to or handled by another person. Or this one, this is a binocular one. When using binoculars outdoors, especially in the wild, you are bound to get dirt on them. However, the worst thing to do would be to leave them dirty. Well, I'm not sure there's the worst thing to do, which is to ruin the optics. An easy way to clean the exterior of binoculars is to use some good quality rubbing alcohol. Pour some rubbing alcohol on a clean cloth and wipe the rubber armor of your binoculars. You can also do this using some cotton pads. You don't just pour the alcohol onto your, your device. Feel free to rub them down clean, but make sure not to get, not to get any alcohol on the lenses, lenses because it will surely damage them beyond repair. Okay, well, yes and no. And this person, you might see this because the article is how to disinfect your camera gear during the coronavirus pandemic, says, I'm absolutely certain 60% alcohol could not harm lens coatings. There are too many lens cleaners that are largely alcohol, not 60%, but close enough. I don't know how people make these statements. So what I did was I looked at two lens cleaners specifically for high-quality lens with coatings. One of them is ROR. It's a well-known one. There is a material safety data sheet, and you can see that isopropyl alcohol is less than 5% of the ingredients in this material. Not 60%, 5%. I also looked for lens cleaning kit, and one of the highly recommended one was from Zeiss. Uh, again, you don't pour these things on optical surfaces. You pour it after you blow off the dust. You pour it on some uh, lens uh, uh, claw material, uh, and then you, you wipe the lens with that. And here you can see that Zeiss isopropyl alcohol uh, is 4 to 6%. So... Uh, again, it does not look like today, um, with the pandemic, which is still around, uh, that loaning binoculars is a good idea, and scopes as well. But I would suggest strongly that you do this search, like I did, uh, and then make a decision. And if you're going to do uh, loaning binoculars or uh, having people switch them, um, liability release forms and warning people about the uh, liabilities uh, are, are, are required. However, there is a scope alternative, by the way. I have a YouTube video on using a Nikon P1000 camera for group field trips to replace a, a spotting scope. And, and let me give you a disclaimer that no manufacturer of equipment sponsored this video. All devices shown I purchased on my own. So what I showed you from July of 2020, uh, those, uh, those pictures, uh, those slides, actually came from this YouTube video. 
And here in July 2020, I say, um, present pandemic, once things become normal, the use of shared items like spotting scopes may have to be reevaluated to guard against spread of disease. And I decided that, gee, if, if you put a 7-inch uh, field monitor on top of a super zoom camera, um, and it's really bright, and some of these are super bright, then people could stand back and take a look at what the camera's looking at. And here the camera has taken pictures of a, uh, of a, uh, a brown pelican, and I, this is magnified. So once you have it here, you can see live views, and then take a picture, and then blow up the picture. The bird has uh, flown away, but you still have the picture. The added advantages are that the participants don't touch optical setup. They don't come close to the tripod. It's about half the price of a high-level spotting scope. Um, remember, you need a good tripod as well. And you end up with a multiple-use camera. You reduce the number of scopes needed for a field trip. And there are a number of these super zoom camera models available. But I want to show you um, what uh, the capabilities are. I'm some I'm set a distance away uh, from the setup, and I can see clearly uh, the image. And in fact, if people had binoculars, they could look at the uh, through binoculars. So if there's a crowd of people looking, they're not close. They don't have to be close to the field monitor. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you. It's always cute to show you what a super zoom can do. There's an osprey on that tower. There's an osprey on that tower. And I'm going to show you a view of an osprey on the outer jetty of Dana Point Harbor in June 30th of 2020. I'm going to go from a 60 power to a half a power, which a camera can do. That's not digital zoom. That's optical zoom. Uh, bird mode setting. And we're looking 1,300 feet away. Okay? So after I press the uh, camera release and start to, uh, to zoom in, there's some uh, um, uh, vibration of the camera, uh, but you can get a feeling, and I could take a picture of that, by the way, and then on the uh, monitor, uh, blow it up digitally. Uh, quite impressive. Now, that was the first thing I used. I have not used it um, uh, since. I did use it for some field trips uh, for Dosan training until the uh, pandemic hit. But now what I've done is I've added a red dot um, cider. Uh, I needed a adapter to uh, put the red dot onto the camera. I have a remote shutter release as well. And so here is the red dot now on top so I can instantly get uh, on the bird. You can see I've glued a, uh, uh, a cold shoe on it. And on the left side is the, uh, uh, the shutter release, the uh, a, a, a remote shutter release. And then what I've done is with an L mount, that uh, one end fits into that uh, cold shoe on the red dot, and uh, it, the other one goes into the 7-inch uh, monitor. And now I've also reduced the length of the uh, cables. So I'm optimistic that this is really a good uh, uh, supplement or even a uh, uh, replacement for a spotting scope. But there's something about looking through optics and looking at a screen. It just isn't quite the same thing. But, um, you, you know, you can be looking at the bird with binoculars and then switch to the, um, uh, to the field monitor and, and see a much better view of it. Okay, so let me tell you some general hints. Be enthusiastic and be yourself. The important thing is to have fun. If you have fun, the group will too. But don't discuss religion, don't discuss politics or sex, at least of humans, and steer the conversation away from those topics. Learn people's names. Names tags would help. Talk about field guides if people need it. Don't talk down to the group. I've been on uh, uh, field trips um, where that happens and, and people get, you know, are really annoyed. Try to find out what some people are looking for. Don't assume anything about the knowledge of the group. Listen to your participants. Don't assume they're looking at the same bird you're looking at. That's always a problem. Uh, that problem is not a problem with the, uh, the, uh, the camera spotting scope. 
in difficult situations, fall back on assertive techniques such as fogging by answer unproved assertions. Someone might say something. You might say, well, you could be right. Don't start off any topic by saying, I don't know much about this, but... So let's get on the trip. Learn to walk backwards while talking. Learn to handle children, not by ignoring them, not by scolding them, but by getting them involved in your talk, by having them assist you in showing pictures, specimens, etc. that you're bringing along. Learn how to point out birds by using landmarks, such as certain shaped branches in that tree over there, uh, or there's a bird on that post uh, to my right. You can also use the clock method to help others find your birds. Recommend resources to the participants, like books, magazines, and especially the organization uh, that you represent. Tell more than just the species' name. Perhaps talk about the origin of the name or some aspect of the ecology of the species. Learn to note the signs of animals, tracks in the mud, burrows, nests, bones. Scat. Do not handle mammalian scat, except with sticks. They contain tapeworm eggs. Leave nests alone, even those abandoned ones. Set a good example for your participants. Learn to tell really, really terrible jokes, preferably puns. Okay. Hey, group, here's three birds, three crows, American crows. They're a murder of crows. Three, three crows. Uh-oh, one flew away. Now what do we have? Well, it's pretty obvious. It's attempted murder. Why does this bird stand on one foot? You get, get that question all the time. Well, if it lifted that foot, it would fall over. No regrets for saying that. Seek out the beginners if you can and pay special attention to them. The hardcore birders are okay on their own. Make sure the beginners see everything and can ID them. They may have trouble finding anything in their binoculars. Don't bluff your way on an identification you aren't sure of. Say, let's figure this out together if we can. You can't identify everything, nor can you always be right 100% of the time. Thank members of the group that point out find interesting species on the field trip. Give credit where credit is due. Inexperienced participants will look to you for identifications, help in finding birds that you see or hear, advice on binoculars. Experienced birders will require less attention, but if from another part of the country, they may want you to confirm what they have identified. Be fa a fairly tough enforcer of rules that keep people together, relatively quiet and attentive. Discourage people in the group from walking in front of the group. Adhere to clear smoking standards. Make sure to ask if everyone has seen the spotted bird that you had just seen before you move on. Try to identify every bird within reason. If it is a very common bird, don't turn it into a 15-minute lecture. The group will become restless. Make sure everyone knows how rare or common a bird is with comments like, you will not see this bird again in your lifetime at this park. I haven't seen it. This is the first time. Or, this bird is very common in this habitat at this time of year. You should learn how to identify the common species. So you'll know when you see an unusual one. Set a sensible pace. Try to generate a lot of questions. In fact, ask group questions. Especially about bird behavior. Why do you think that bird's doing that? Ask folks not to pull out their field guides while the bird is still in view, but to try and absorb the bird and then look at the guide. Try to develop an ability to identify birds by song. And the app Merlin, uh, which you should know about if you don't, can help identify uh, birds by sound. It has a recording device and it will give you some options. Try to tell a little bit about the bird's habitats as well and habits and why it is found here rather than elsewhere. If lots of children are along, or beginners, look for big and flashy birds that don't move much. Don't use the word just, saying, well, that's just a crow. All creatures are important and interesting, and they have their own natural history. Try to include everyone when describing something. No question is a stupid question. 
be patient and answer every question directly and thoroughly to the best of your ability. If you don't know an answer, admit it and indicate. You might have the answer in your reference library, remember your reference library, back at your car. Then ask the person to remind you later to look up the answer. Try to talk to everybody at least once or twice through the, throughout the trip. Track moving birds for people. Be prepared to explain the relevant field marks or jizz of the species. Don't be afraid to go into natural history, personal experiences, and good stories and personal anecdotes. The more you gab, not lecture, the more people relax around you. Do gentle reminders. These are locally rare plants, which we take care not to walk on. Now, let's talk again about COVID concerns. This is from San Sage and the Christmas Count. People who have not received their COVID vaccinations will not be allowed on any Christmas bird count this year. We need to make sure that our counts are safe for everyone. Otherwise, we will have to cancel them. Everyone must wear a mask during a carpooling. It's usually done on Christmas counts. When outside, each party must wear masks. If, even, though we're, even though they're outside. If one member of the party requests that masks be worn, each party will have a participant limit to allow for social distancing. And I would suggest that uh, there will be a supply of new masks for participants. Anybody who is um, uh, in charge of a subunit of Christmas bird counts be ready for people who have forgotten masks. So at the end of the trip, we're at the end of the trip, I guess, almost. Leave the public with some upbeat upbeat thoughts on what you have seen. The value of nature, our responsibilities to conserve birds, the need to secure their future, and our responsibilities to future generations. Tell them at the end who sponsored the trip, what they can do to join or support the organization. And then the last topic I want to talk about is other situations and issues. If a beginner has to identify a bird on their own, they will never forget it. If they are told what it is in a callous and hurried way, they will not learn the bird. And so you might not want to immediately say what that bird is. You might ask uh, for uh, thoughts. Do people know what that bird is? Who does not know? What type of bird is it? Is that a sparrow? Is that a heron? Etc. So you want to try and teach them the art of bird identification. Problems you may face. A person who demands all your time and attention, you must prevent this person from dominating your time. The shy beginner who may not let you know that they can't see the bird the rest of the group is looking at. Maybe it's their equipment. Bathroom breaks. Safety. Thirsty people. Poison oak and ivy. People with bad optics, people with physical disabilities. These are all situations that you're going to have to face and be prepared for them. As one ages, you tend to lose the ability to hear for high frequencies. If the group is composed of older birders, pointing out calls of wax wings and songs of many other birds to an elderly group of birders is just going to frustrate them. They're not going to hear it. You may, unless you have some devices that will lower the frequency, something called song finder, which is no longer made. You may have on the field trip people who are loud, people who are afraid of heights or narrow paths along cliffs. Warn the group about these at the start and find alternate routes around for those with such aversions. Set the pace of the trip to the slowest person, but be aware that you don't want to lose the others in the meantime should be a compromise there. Sometimes you will have a self-anointed other leader in your group. There's a lot of discussion on that. Some leaders may feel threatened at this or embarrassed or whatever, but I suggest you greet it with relief. Learn from them. Have them introduce themselves to the group. What's their background? You have a situation where many more eyes are doing the real work. If the person gets out of hand correcting you, maybe they're right though. Trying to go ahead of the group with his or her own group. Make them teach the entire group what they think they know. Encourage participants to ask those individuals questions. If all else fails, just ask the person quietly to take it at the whole group's pace because you have an agenda and you represent the organization that's running the the talk. 
Finally, if it is a school group or a weekend type workshop, say of teachers, which I've done, who are being bused to the site and someone gets seriously sick or injured, then that's your first responsibility and must be resolved before you continue your field trip or turn it over to someone else. For the latter situation, it probably is a good idea to have a private car along for emergencies. I've been in that situation and had to drive a participant to a hospital um, and uh, spend about a half a day with that. So I hope this, uh, that essay in 1996 updated, uh, partly from uh, the uh, Burning Magazine, uh, partly from uh, COVID uh, protocols today, uh, is useful for you, gives you some ideas. You may not agree with all of them, uh, but uh, uh, it's there. So this is another bit of one of my JDW talks on YouTube. I have YouTube talks on census resources, Ellis Island immigration, natural history topics, and virtual birding field trips, and any uh, areas that I have interest in. So uh, go out and field trips. Uh, beginners, don't, don't be shy. Uh, don't uh, be overwhelmed. Um, and, uh, and hopefully uh, uh, you will get a lot out of these field trips and you're on your path to leading field trips yourself when you become more experienced. Good birding.